Lapland in Sweden, one of Europe's great wildernesses. It's December. The sun does not rise above the horizon and temperatures drop below minus 30. Here, 200 kilometers above the Arctic Circle, sits the world-famous Ice Hotel. It is incredibly cold. I, I suppose if you're going to build an ice hotel anywhere, it has to be somewhere cold. The polar light, sparkling snow and sprawling forests make for a landscape that is almost otherworldly. Look at this. Wow. So beautiful. Oh. It's an incredibly unusual hotel, with a dramatic beauty carved from the snow and ice that surround it. Wow. That's amazing. They have pioneered ice chandeliers, an ice bar. Oh, it's quite cool. It's quite funny. Local delicacies served on ice crockery. And every room is different from the next with its own unique work of ice art. For the privilege of sleeping in an ice room, guests pay up to a thousand pounds per night. And with the possibility of northern lights, the nights can be beautiful. But they are also long. You don't see the sun from mid-December until the middle of January. Mornings at the hotel start at 7.30. I'm going to find out how you deal with guests who've been sleeping in a freezer. The 20 rooms are kept at a bone-chilling minus five. My first job is helping Mike from housekeeping to wake up the guests. Can people be grumpy when you come to wake them up? Yeah. What are your strategies to, to cheer up the grumpy people? Uh, lingonberry juice, <laughs> I would say. That it's usually, all in the juice. Yeah, it's all in the juice. Well, let's, let's hope they're in a good mood. Yeah. <laughs> Lingonberries grow wild across Sweden, and a hot juice is a popular way to wake up here. Good morning. Good morning. Something warm to drink. How's the night been? Um, it's been cold, <laughs> but amazing. I mean, warm in the thermal um, sleeping bag, which is fantastic. But you kind of have to cover yourself right up and breathe through a little hole. Did you sleep in your thermals? One, two, three. Three layers, yeah. plus a sleeping bag. Dear me. Yeah. I'm doing it tonight. Are you? I'm a bit it's nervous. Just, it's just one of those life experiences you can't have necessarily anywhere else. Yeah. I've got a long night ahead of me. Thank you. There are no power points or phones in the rooms. Would you like me to turn the lights on? So the only way to wake people up is the old-fashioned way. Hi, guys. <laughs> How was the night? Oh, there's two of you. That's nice. How was it? It's a mission getting in and out of the sleeping bag. <laughs> it wasn't cold at all, really. Like, just the top of your nose. Oh, gosh, well, that's good to know. I'm yeah. doing it tonight. Oh, are you? <laughs> yeah, but I'm on my own. Oh, now you'll be fine. Just no do the sleeping bag up nice and tight. <laughs> See you. Bye. See ya. Why do people want to come and stay in that temperature? You rarely have a comfortable bed like this in minus five somewhere else, and you, like, the rooms are filled with art, and it's not just the ice stall, it's everything around it as well. There's so much uh, in one place. This rare combination attracts 30,000 guests every year. Around a quarter are Swedes, while most come from the UK and the USA. It's your room, slow. Very cool. Then I will show you. So welcome inside. Oh my, oh <laughs> my God. Tim from New York and Mary from Chicago are best friends. It's been their dream to stay at Ice Hotel for more than 10 years. I love the window. So this time, we need to do something different. This is the most different you can get. <laughs> <laughs> and adventure. I, everybody we talk to is like, oh, it's on my bucket list. This is something I want to do. It's amazing. It's, it's beautiful. Before we leave, Mashpee's resident biologist, Carlos Moretz, wants to show me one of his most promising research projects. A series of camera traps around the reserve that capture the forest's nocturnal activity. It's right here, see? They work with an infrared sensor, so they sense the heat and the movement of the animal. Yeah. Before, in this site, we used to have just mostly rodents, 
at the beginning for the first year, and now we've been getting interesting, interesting. Oh, results. come on, let's do it. Armadillo. Wait. And it's in the shot. Yeah. Oh, look at oh, it. Look at it. That's oh, a very wow. nice picture, you see? You have all the... <laughs> this thing. Wow, look. That's uh, an agouti. Oh, agouti? Agouti. It's a rodent. That's it's a like big rat. twice the size of a guinea pig. That is amazing. It's very nice. Under Roque's protection, there's been a huge increase in smaller mammals that were previously hunted for food. But there's been some bigger surprises too. I will show you... Something very, very interesting that we saw last last year. Oh, look at that. We have a puma. Beauty. <laughs> okay. Wild puma have been pushed to the brink of extinction here in Ecuador. So to see these individuals thriving alongside the lodge is a real success. Look at this video. <gasps> it's got baby. One cup. Two. Two cups. Three. Three. Oh my word. So this is, some, oh, this that is something is so very, neat. very rare. Yeah. That tells you also that the forest is in good shape. The sighting of species thought extinct provides yet more proof of the success of Roque's vision. We have found, for instance, birds that haven't been seen since 1936. And that happened just six months ago. That gives us a lot of hope that we can recover many, many forms of life. And that's the good news. Roque's work is not just benefiting the natural world. Mashpee Lodge is on the verge of making a profit, and he's offering the local community a share of the financial rewards from the hotel they've helped make a success. The objective is that the people who live in the area will be our partners. I feel I'm very lucky to have had the opportunity to de develop this. The help of the people has been invaluable, and uh, they're part of it now. A place like this could never be arrived at by committee. Uh, it's just, it's too crazy. It requires one person uh, with a very rooted uh, feeling about his country and, and, and the land, and a lot of money, he feels that it offers great hope for the ecological future of places like this, and it may do, but it also does offer you the slightly scary vision that none of this is going to be repeated anywhere unless there are lots of roques, and I slightly wonder whether there are. Look at that one. The colours are stunning when you get in the light, aren't they? Don't you think Mashpee Lodge has basically, in terms of the wild versus comfort balance, don't you think they've nailed it? Absolutely. Five-star luxury, yet also the huge emphasis on getting out of the hotel and seeing the real reason it's there. And that's to, to, to preserve this, this little bit of paradise that we have left. If we're to understand why this Martian spacecraft on stilts has been built out here on the rocks, then the best person to ask is the architect, Todd Saunders. Hey, Todd. Yeah, hi, Giles. Do you do this often, come out here and have a fire? Uh, every now and then. Every now and then, I'd come out and have a cup of coffee with some other people around. Me. And admire your handiwork? I try to. <laughs> <laughs> Zeta picked Todd both for his talent and because he's a local boy with local knowledge. I grew up here. Yeah. I knew the scent, the smells, the berries, the food they ate. I knew the type of people here. And so I didn't need any explanation of what Newfoundland architecture could be. Yeah. Tell me about the stilts. Yeah, it's a bit of a homage to the past. All the buildings are built on little stilts because they didn't have sand here actually to do concrete. And the fishermen didn't have time to make foundations. So the fastest way to do it was just put them on these wooden poles, make a flat level, and then build the building above it. And they're not all straight, some of them are at angles. Is that a, yeah. an aesthetic thing? Yeah, or is... it was a bit the way they always did it. They never did them perfectly straight. It was a more haphazard thing. So the, the buildings actually have this amphibious quality to them. They look like they're half on land, half in water. In 2008, this exposed location was chosen for the inn. 
construction began with steel, concrete and black spruce, a design built to withstand the test of time and weather. The inn took three years to complete, using around 70% locally sourced materials. And the 450 passionately committed people involved in realising the project all had to adhere to one golden rule. It had to feel familiar, but modern. There was a special feeling about a Newfoundland home and I, we couldn't put our finger on it. And we said, you know, everything on this island was from this island before. So we said, okay, everything in this inn will be made on the island. So everything's made at a workshop just up, this, up the road. And were, up were you made on the island? Uh, I was you... made an hour away from here. <laughs> really? <laughs> in you the back you... seat of a Boso Egg and a Beetle. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. Todd's architecture is clearly having an impact. The inn has only been open a few years and already there are returning guests. Janet Fitzpatrick, a psychiatrist from the mainland, is on her eighth visit. I come here and there's just a peace that comes over me. As soon as I walk in this inn, I feel I can breathe. And you speak very highly of the people. The people are, are fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. And they love this, this island. Everybody here loves where they live. You come and stay here for a few days and you understand that. You understand that feeling. I mean, the thing I really hope that every person that comes to the inn gets a really strong sense of is place, 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 place. Zita's ambition for the inn is to reflect everything that's special about this island in terms of nature and culture. Giraffe Manor employs over 65 people, three for every guest to serve their every whim. Five chefs, five porters, 11 waiters, four drivers and four gardeners. It's a tight team. And duty manager Tony Levy has the job of keeping everyone on track, whether staff, guests or giraffe. So the biggest challenges I face as duty manager is probably guest expectations. You have realized that 140 acres here, we have 10 giraffe on site. I have to manage unpredictable giraffe movements in the sense that the giraffe refuses to show up. This way, please. Up to you. I have to manage the guests between checkout and check-in time, trying to get rooms ready. There's constant moving. This way, please. It's 8 a.m. and Laura and Emmanuel are arriving on the first day of their honeymoon. We spent probably twice as much on the honeymoon as we did on the actual wedding. <laughs> And to know that tomorrow morning we can wake up and be feeding a giraffe out of the bedroom window mm -hmm. is really cool. I'm going to feel like I haven't woken up. It's going to feel like a dream. Despite the charms of the giraffe, Laura and Emmanuel are only staying here for one night. Like most guests, they're using the manor as a staging post on their way to other parts of Kenya. This means the manor's nine housekeepers face a pressurised changeover of rooms every 24 hours. I'm joining head housekeeper Pamela on her morning rounds. She and her team usually have between 45 minutes and an hour to turn over all 10 rooms. Pamela is one of the longest serving members of staff. At 64, she's been making beds here for the last 17 years. Oh, I love the feel of clean sheets. <laughs> Aside from the mess caused by guests, Pamela has to deal with long-necked intruders. Does this stay down here? It will stay. We will put it on the... Do tray. they just yes. come and stick their heads in? Yeah. No, when, the, when we shake the bucket, ah. the giraffes will come, okay. and then you'll take one by one. Okay. Do them. they make a mess for you when you Yeah, when to... there's nobody around and the window is open, if they come here near, they'll push the bucket and then <laughs> down. <That makes> sense. <laughs> to yeah. give you, yeah. give you a bit of a headache. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do you have a certain time when you have to have it all finished? By 12. They'll be checking in at 13. At 1 o'clock? Yes, okay. please. If you can show me a quicker way, I'll okay. show you my way. Fine. That's going to be a simpler way to... <laughs> it's like a Zumba class. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look how strong you are. As a single mother, Giraffe Manor has had a big impact on Pamela's family life. One of the children works here too. Working at Giraffe Manor, I have used my money in bringing up my children, paying the education for high school for four of them, and in college 
Do you have enough to cover the mattress? At the moment, I am now saving for a piece of small land. Then I build there my house, <laughs> which I'll call my home. That looks pretty good to me. I'd sleep in it. One of the oldest buildings in suburban Nairobi, Giraffe Manor was built in 1932, when Kenya was still a colony of the British Empire. The most surprising thing is how suburban it feels. You're sort of prepared for something sort of wild, and obviously it looks like African savannah, but it feels like Surrey with giraffes. There is this desire to recreate something that looks like suburban England, something sort of normal and kind of golf clubby. It's just that they're giraffes. Uh, and I guess that's Africa as imagined by English people. But what are the challenges of running this historic hotel? So this is the dining room. Wow. Which has absolutely no electricity or candlelit. So you're offering people a nostalgic return to a simpler way of living. Is that one of the things that people are De looking for? Definitely. People are definitely looking for a time in a simpler environment, I think. With Wi-Fi? With Wi-Fi. So you provide that for them and that freedom and that return and that nostalgia. But do they have other expectations of home comfort? Food, accommodation. I mean, this house, we really struggle because a lot of, you know, a lot of, certainly the plumbing is uh, archaic. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, it's nearly 100 years old and it's African. Yeah. And yes, and, and, and then you're dealing with, you know, what's available on the market, which isn't what's available in London or New York. But, uh, but I think p generally people are quite forgiving, thankfully, to us because we've got giraffes. Marrakesh is one of the most beguiling cities in North Africa. Once the capital of an Arab empire that stretched across the Mediterranean to Spain, for many centuries, it was used by Moroccan kings to showcase their culture to the world. And that's a tradition that today's king, Mohammed VI, wants to revive with the luxurious hotel he has built, Royal Mansour. We represent the kingdom. You are staying in, in, in the showcase of the kingdom. The man tasked with implementing the royal vision is managing director Jean-Claude Messon. Ambition is very simple here. Uh, and it's very easy to explain to the staff the ambition. It's to be number one. For the next few days, we're joining Jean-Claude and his staff to find out how they deliver their ambition and whether it succeeds. Good morning. You guys are very warm welcome. And with Monica in her office clothes, I'm feeling a little bit underdressed. Welcome to Sunny Marrakesh and, and Roy Monsieur. This is a hotel where staff can outnumber guests by 10 to 1. We'll be looked after by our very own butler, Mohammed. You are very welcome to uh, Royal Mansour. I will be pleased to be your butler during your stay. Thank and, you. Uh, it's, you uh, are butler just for us? Yes, sir. Just a stone's throw away from the teeming heart of the city, Royal Mansour is a peaceful haven. It's made up of 53 separate residences known as Riyadh. The traditional Moroccan Riyadh is designed for privacy. Facing inwards to a central courtyard, it therefore suits the needs of the presidents, diplomats and A-listers who can afford to stay here, spending between 1,000 and a staggering 35,000 pounds per night. Welcome to your Riyadh, Mr. Koran. Look at this. It's amazing. Is this all mine? Yes, sir all £3,000 per night's worth of it. The living room. It's just so beautiful. Now, this is the guest room, sir. Very nice. The first floor, madam. I've never had so much space to myself before. To understand the levels of service expected of them, Royal Mansour staff are given a guest experience. So, Mohammed, you said you've stayed in the Riyadh like this. I did, madam. How, how did you find that? They escorted me from my, from my house to the hotel, in the hotel's car, uh, welcomed me in the main entrance, the same welcome they would do for any of the guests. I still remember that feeling I got. Being special. Nobody can explain it unless you, you try it, unless you leave it yourself. Guests Victoria and Antoine are accustomed to exclusive hotels. 
but this is their first experience of the Royal Mansour. The Royal Mansour allows a sense of wonder. There's a grandeur to walking through the doors and feeling like you're entering somewhere magical.